because of the subject matter of this course having to do with the environment and agricultural production, it's not surprising that a lot of our authors look into the future and try to figure out whether we'll survive and if so, how. This week, two of our speakers will lead us into the debate on uh, GMOs or genetically modified organisms. And I asked you to read one author for this week, um, a chapter out of Wendell Berry's The Unsettling of America, um, chapter five, which is entitled Living in the Future. So we have two authors who are positive about genetically modified organisms and about agricultural technology generally um, as a way of dealing with the changes that are going to happen in their view um, in the future, especially climate change. And then we have one author, Wendell Berry, who represents the position not just against GMOs, but um, questioning the goodness of all technological progress or technological progress generally. So we have a kind of point-counterpoint this week, but instead of just dealing with the ins and outs of GMOs and the debate about those that you may already be familiar with, I thought it would be more interesting to use Barry to kind of take a step back and look at the social implications um, of technological change. And we may find that, uh, that we can't come to a, a conclusion at the end of this week about which one of these approaches um, makes more sense because uh, you'll probably find that both of them make sense. And that's one of the frustrating aspects of this subject matter is everybody's trying to deal with difficult choices. Uh, we live in a world with many, many problems, as people always have. And the choices that we make um, ultimately aren't perfect. And there are always risks involved and uh, unintended consequences from any choice we make. And that's why you'll probably feel, especially at the end of this week, like you're not sure, and that's okay. That's part of what this course is supposed to do, is to give you a more realistic picture of the problem, the problems that we're facing. If we're going to come up with any solutions, we have to start from that realistic picture, that realistic perspective, um, understanding that the problems are really, really big and that many people have come up with, with persuasive and, and uh, answers worth considering. So we have Pamela Ronald, who's co-author with R.W. Adam Chack, who's her husband, of a book entitled Tomorrow's Table, Organic Farming, Genetics, and the Future of Food. Um, and you saw her TED Talk on uh, GMOs. She is, I believe, co-director of the Ronald Laboratory for Crop Genetics and Scientific Literacy. And I have um, her website there, the uh, website address for the laboratory. From that website, I got this bio. Pamela Ronald is a distinguished professor in the Department of Plant Pathology and the Genome Center at UC Davis and also serves as Director of Grass Genetics at the Joint Bioenergy Institute in Emeryville, California, and Faculty Director of the UC Davis Institute for Food and Agricultural Literacy. In 2017 to 2018, she is serving as a fellow slash visiting professor in the Center for Food Security and the Environment at Stanford University. Ronald's laboratory studies the genetic basis of resistance to disease and tolerance to stress in rice. Together with her collaborators, she has engineered rice for resistance to disease and tolerance to flooding, which seriously threaten rice crops in Asia and Africa. And we'll learn more about what uh, Ronald has to say in a moment. But uh, our other author, author, I should say our other speaker, um, is Robert Fraley. I had you watch um, a talk that he gave at K-State in 2015, which deals with GMO technology and other agricultural technologies that Monsanto is at the forefront of. Fraley is Monsanto's Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer, and um, this bio I got also from the official site for Dr. Fraley. 
Dr. Robert Fraley is an Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of Monsanto Company, where he leads a team of agricultural scientists dedicated to developing seeds and solutions that help farmers around the world yield a more abundant, affordable, and sustainable food supply. In this role, he oversees teams of researchers focused on plant breeding, plant biotechnology, ag biologicals, ag microbials, precision agriculture, and crop protection innovations that will help to feed our growing population. So you can see that both of these speakers are concerned about a lot of the same things, particularly food insecurity, um, the fact that the world's population continues to grow, and um, the, uh, the imperative to keep up with that growth, to, to use a phrase that Monsanto uses, feed the world. You know, what both these speakers have in common is pretty amazing. Both are thinking about the future, of course, and both are, in their own way, accelerationists. Um, we studied accelerationism last week, so you know that it has to do not just with looking into the future to figure out what's going to happen, but um, an active role in adjusting to future demands through the use of um, science, technology, planning, etc., um, to move human beings to a point not just of hopefully adapting to future changes, but overcoming them if possible. And the second point um, is that their views, um, particularly Fraley's, because he's um, associated with uh, private enterprise, uh, would be more acceptable to neoliberal free market conservatives than positions that are skeptical of GMOs and other um, big ag technologies. You may remember our left accelerationists from last week in the Accelerationist Manifesto being very skeptical about neoliberalism, um, which is basically conservative free market ideology. I will point out that both Ronald and Fraley do affirm their belief in climate change and that actually um, their certainty about climate, ch climate change is what uh, they say propels their interest in, in developing technology to meet the, the demands um, upon us of climate change that will affect what we can grow, where we can grow it, um, and all sorts of factors, many of which um, are, of course, not completely known. But in that way, both of them differ from some neoliberal uh, thinkers who are skeptical of climate change. So I wanted to make note of that because oftentimes um, critics of, of folks like, especially um, Dr. Fraley, uh, tend to think of, of, all of all of those folks as climate deniers, as they might put it. And, um, you know, that it may surprise you that, that um, Fraley in particular is not a climate uh, change denier. And before I go on into further discussion of them, we also read Wendell Berry, uh, The Unsettling of America, Chapter 5, Living in the Future. And um, among other things, Berry is a poet, and so from the Poetry Foundation website, I found a good bio for him. Poet, novelist, and environmentalist Wendell Berry lives on a farm in Port Royal, Kentucky, near his birthplace, where he has maintained a farm for over 40 years. Mistrust of technology, he holds, mistrustful of technology, he holds deep reverence for the land and is a staunch defender of agrarian values. He is the author of over 40 books of poetry, fiction, and essays. His poetry celebrates the holiness of life and everyday miracles often taken for granted. Critics and scholars have acknowledged Wendell Berry as a master of many literary genres, but whether he is writing poetry, fiction, or essays, his message is essentially the same. Humans must learn to live in harmony with the natural rhythms of the earth or perish. The Unsettling of America, Culture and Agriculture, which analyzes the many failures of modern mechanized life, is one of the key texts of the environmental movement, but Barry, a political maverick, has criticized environmentalists as well as those involved with big businesses and land development. In contrast to our speakers, Robert or Ronald and, and um, Fraley, Wendell Berry concentrates on what we've lost 
and what we stand to lose through technological innovation, and he urges us to slow down and reconsider. Also in contrast to our two speakers, his view would be more acceptable to classical conservatives that emphasize tradition, continuity, and the fragility of the social fabric. I did want to point out and emphasize that all three of our authors would appeal to a type of conservative, but all three of them um, are not at all the same in their conservatism. And as his bio points out, Wendell Berry is just very hard to pin down. Um, but his attitude towards technological innovation and innovation generally is very uh, classically conservative. I wouldn't want to hazard a guess as to whether Ronald and Fraley were conservatives in that sense. I'm simply saying that their, um, their arguments would sit better with um, neoliberal conservatives or free market conservatives, whereas Wendell Berry's argument would sit much better with classical conservatives or traditionalists. And that may be a distinction that uh, most of you have not contemplated, um, but there are two very different types of conservatism that go off in, in two different directions. And hopefully one of the things that you'll get out of this week, this week's viewings and reading, is, is this distinction. Now I want to focus in on Pamela, Pamela Ronigal's um, TED Talk briefly and highlight a few of the points that she makes. Uh, she argues that climate change is happening due to global warming and that we must uh, realize this and we must adjust to it. We must start to think about how we will survive in a changing climate. And then she argues that GMOs can help people adjust to climate change and survive. She talks about how her own laboratory has helped people do this in India um, and in general helped with uh, rice crop production in Asia where climate change has led to more flooding for longer periods of time and has threatened traditional rice crops. So they genetically modified rice plants to deal with more flooding, more water for longer periods of time, and she shows that that was successful. And she also talks about modifying the genetics of rice to include more vitamin A to fight malnutrition. She points out that GMOs can help us use far less pesticide and artificial fertilizer because plants can be um, modified in ways that are pest resistant and are hardier, and that that helps the environment and by implication may slow down climate change. And I think maybe the most important part of her talk is the point um, that she argues we shouldn't be so afraid of uh, genetic modification uh, because actually human beings have been altering plant and animal genetics ever since at least the agricultural revolution, so for thousands of years. People do that through practices such as seed selection, where they take the seeds from the most successful and hardiest plants and save them and use them the next year. They do it with cross-pollinization and grafting. And in the area of animal husbandry, of course, with animal breeding. And so she would just argue that it's a misunderstanding to think that this is something new. But of course now we do it in a laboratory and it happens much more quickly than it did before. But in her view that doesn't make it a different enterprise. And um, she says there's no evidence that um, GMOs are harmful to people. Um, and more than that, she argues that they're more or less a necessity because especially in developing countries, we really don't have the luxury of not innovating. The population continues to grow, climate changes, which, in which increases the um, vulnerability of their traditional crops. And uh, this is a way of allowing people to continue to uh, survive and thrive in their own lands. If we look at the Ronald Lab website, we find that the research it conducts is funded by government agencies like the National Science Foundation, the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Energy, and also private foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates and the Rockefeller Foundations. And one distinction between what Ronald does 
and uh, Fraley has to do with exactly that, where the funding comes from, and this kind of relates back to some of our discussion of last week, so just to kind of consider um, whether the difference is, is a, a valid one or the distinction is a valid one between how Ronald does her research and the way Monsanto does her research, um, his, its research. Monsanto's research is, of course, funded by the company from the profits it makes from um, all of the various technologies and products that it makes for big agriculture. And so rather than receiving funding, Monsanto gives funding, and it does so, um, I think Fraley mentioned in his talk, fellowships, scholarships, um, funding for research at um, universities. Um, it is a source of research funding instead of taking research funding. So that's a difference. Robert Fraley has a tougher case to make because of the fact that he's part of a profit-making business, and he knows this. Um, you can tell in his talk that he starts out um, with an acknowledgement, basically, or an understanding that he is somewhat behind the eight ball in his argument because um, people have become suspicious of GMOs and big ag technology, and he states that his company made a mistake uh, when not early on educating the public about the changes that were taking place. And at this point, um, they are trying to catch up. Um, he makes mention of the use of social media and other techniques for trying to educate the public um, about what they do. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, all you need to do is Google either Pamela Ronald or Robert F Fraley or both. And among the things that you'll find is a lot of accusations about the motives of, um, of speakers and authors like them. A lot of fear and a lot of suspicion. Um, and this is the political dimension of this whole debate. Harking back to what we talked about um, regarding the science and the, t uh, the scientific um, backing and opposition to the tobacco industry, um, we see the whole scene coming into play here with GMOs. What I mean by that is that inevitably people are either for or against GMOs, and then that quickly becomes, um, that position quickly becomes politicized and a part of an overall political ideology. And those positions tend to bring out um, the most outsized emotions and convictions on the part of people. Among the points in his talk that are worth noting are that, first of all, world population is growing and will continue to grow, but will eventually level off with female education as countries develop. He argues that the birth rate is correlated with the level of female education and so there is an end to population growth to the point where we will level off. Um, if we didn't have hope that population growth would level off, it would be difficult to place as much hope in um, the possibility of technology to keep up with the food production for that expanding growth. He points out that as countries develop, which is something we want so that um, popu population growth will level off, the middle class is continuing to expand and the middle class will demand better food and more food and so that's going to further increase food demand so he estimates that we will need double our food supply by the year 2050 to keep up with this demand. Fraley argues that GMO technology can help us meet the demands for increasing food supply by fighting the effects of climate change. So he too is worried about climate change and sees GMOs as an answer to adjusting to the deleterious effects of climate change. He also argues that we can use technological and scientific advances combined with better information technology 
to increase food production in developing countries. So he makes much of the fact that information technology is uh, going down in price, it's much more readily available, and it can be used by everybody, including people in uh, countries that are still developing, to spread information about how to farm effectively. He also talks about new technologies that will turn farming ever more into a precise science. Um, technologies such as digitized soil analysis, which I kind of envisioned was on the ground, you know, part of the, uh, a part of the equipment um, that is used um, that can basically uh, map out a field, even um, divide it into quadrants, maybe understanding that the soil in one part of that field is different from another, needs more uh, fertilizer or some input compared to a, another part of the field. Um, same thing with moisture mapping. And then he also talks about probi probiotic seed coating uh, to bring more uh, micronutrients back into the soil and, uh, and nourish the crops that are grown. So Fraley is very convinced that all these innovations are necessary and beneficial for meeting the demands that we are going to face in the future based upon um, a great growth in population. And along the way, he discusses how um, agricultural technology has changed how farming is done in very dramatic ways. Now, these numbers can be different depending on who you talk to and what you read, so I'm not going to try to become terribly precise about this. Um, Fraley says that about 1% of the population in America is engaged in agricultural production today, as opposed to around 50% a hundred years ago or so. And we've covered uh, a lot about this already, so I won't belabor it. That is about how that happened, but it has to do with the um, increase in technology, the use of new technologies that allows one farmer to farm a lot more land. It has to do with the development of monocultural farming and, and things that we've already studied. Suffice it to say that he's right, that a lot, lot fewer people farm and that each person engaged in farming is responsible for the production of a lot more food um, than they used to be. So noting Fraley's statement about this change, um, I want to turn to Wendell Berry and particularly to the parts of Berry's chapter where he deals with the social change and cultural change involved and how, in other words, this change in agriculture affected uh, people, particularly in the United States. Barry writes about how the agricultural revolution um, that made for the need for far fewer hands on the farms created an exodus from the country to cities, um, but didn't necessarily supply people uh, leaving the countryside with um, equally meaningful or gainful employment, creating a large urban underclass of underemployed and unemployed people. Small communities in the country were devastated as their businesses dried up, um, families broke up, children moved away, um, and traditional ways of life were destroyed. We tend to not think of small town rural America as a cultural treasure that's been destroyed by modern enterprise um, but that's how Wendell Berry sees it. The stability of it, the neighborly um, manners and habits, the healthier and less complicated lifestyle have gone away in the wake of this exodus from country to city and left in their wake suburbs of people who work in the city but long for a more rural way of life and so go back out to the country but just to sleep. So he takes on this guy Billard uh, who wrote an article in National Geographic that was generally positive about the situation. Um, he quotes Billard um, on page 68 saying, N and that's my book, 68, your page numbers are maybe different, Billard says, not all small towns are dying. The smog and the traffic and the social unrest of megalopolis 
prompts a second look at the advantages of living in small communities. Industry freed by jet planes and superhighways from dependence on nearby markets shifts its plants away from the cities. Employees are drawn by such appeals as being able, 10 minutes after leaving work, to be out on the golf course or roaming the woods with gun and dog or watching kids and crops grow in a handful of acres a man can call his own. So, of course, the commute is probably more than 10 minutes at this point, and uh, people find themselves commuting for long, long, much longer periods of time than that. Um, and living in the suburbs partly because living in the city is too expensive. But at this point of time, back in the 70s, this was just starting to happen, and I do remember people writing about it quite positively um, and thinking of it as perhaps an advance. So Barry writes about this, um, quote, Thus, if country people are forced to move into the city, that is made up for, according to Mr. Billard, by the movement of city people and the city itself into the country. But that only looks like a balanced equation. The people who move into the city and those who move out of the country into the country are hardly the same people. The country community of, quote, inefficient and therefore socially negligible people, end quote, is broken up to be replaced by an influx of urban people who, however efficient, have no economic or cultural ties to the land and are not a community. In this exchange, we lose country people, we lose community, and we lose land and we lose the inner city, which is abandoned to those who cannot perform efficiently, either in the city or in the country. So overall, the way that Wendell Berry looks at this is that it has been a cultural and social catastrophe that has largely gone uh, under-noticed, you might say, and has left a lot of um, destroyed ways of life in its wake, has wrecked a lot of families, has torn families apart, um, and is, is one of those changes that he uh, rather regrets. And um, what's unclear to readers who, who read this book, I've talked to a lot of people who've read this book, um, they don't know exactly what Wendell Berry wants us to do about it. Um, is, is it possible to go back somehow? And that's a question that isn't adequately answered by this book, so we'll just say that right now. Um, he's very good in the book at talking about the damage that's been done uh, by these changes, but not as good in this book about um, what, if anything, can be done to remedy the damage. However, it is a valuable perspective to be able to step back and see that the types of changes that have taken place in America are as cataclysmic as some of those changes that have taken place in the developing world when... Um, globalization hits and their economies change rapidly and drastically. Wendell Berry is basically saying it happened first here and out elsewhere in his book he talks about how it happened first with the Native Americans when in the wake of um, white settlement were driven off of their land and their ways of life were destroyed and they were made to conform to a new way of life and then the same thing happened with multiple groups um, later on with whites um, who settled in the Midwest and engaged in farming, um, who then were uprooted and their lives were uh, or their ways of life were destroyed. He's not equating the two, but he's saying there's some similarity there because it's the economic system and the technological innovation that dictates how people are going to live and where they're going to live, and in his view, doesn't mind disrupting their lives drastically. Barry tries to imagine the farm of the future, and he gets a lot of things right, as I'm sure you noticed, including a jet-powered helicopter spraying insecticides. Well, I don't know about helicopters, but basically his vision isn't too far off from the way a lot of modern farming operates. Remote-controlled tiller combines, I think we have those. He writes about an article from 1974's American Farmer of a dream farm projected into the year 2076. That is really scientific and automated. And I just want to focus on the questions he asks, which are still questions that are worth asking. First, um, Wendell Berry asks of the, basically the futuristic vision of agriculture, was any attention given to the possible social and economic effects of the projected innovations? Two, 
what political consequences were anticipated. For instance, what would be the impact upon the doctrines of personal and private property. Third, what would be the effect upon the consumer? Would there be more or less choice or variety in quality? Fourth, what would be the effect on the environment? All of these questions are in response to a particular futuristic vision by a Dr. Milo Hellickson, but they're also questions that could be asked of any innovation. These are questions I'm sure Wendell Berry would ask of Ronald and Fraley when it comes to GMOs and other um, agricultural technologies. And Wendell Berry has a reputation for being kind of a radical or revolutionary thinker and sometimes of being a leftist, but these are all very conservative questions in the classical conservative sense. The first one has to do with unintended consequences. Um, how much thought is given to what will happen to society because of the technological innovation. We already know what he thinks about how um, changes in agricultural technology affected uh, rural communities, for instance. He also has the opinion that the political consequences of these innovations have reduced the amount of personal liberty and private property by reducing the number of people who own and, and run farms. And as an agrarian, he believes that liberty and property are tied up together, um, that a person who has no property and is sort of at the beck and call of an employer and may have to move many times uh, does not have as much actual personal liberty and therefore not as much of a stable, solid position in society to be used to, um, to be used to be a citizen. The third question has to do with an unknown, which is, is the consumer really benefited by the changes? Um, something that we can't really know for sure until we're already there. Um, at some point in the future, but the question of choice of variety and quality um, is a good one. Uh, one could might say at this point um, that in variety we have more variety, uh, but the question I suppose is still open when it comes to quality, um, with people having different points of view about whether the quality of agricultural production has gone up or gone down based on various factors such as palatability, and also nutritional quality. And finally, the question of what would be the effect on the environment um, is a question, again, that can't be fully answered or may only be answered fully once the effect has already happened. But the type of thinker Wendell Berry is, he tends to be skeptical, and he tends to think that um, usually when people promise that they will fix a problem, they end up creating another problem. We've already visited that way of thinking, and he's one of those. Barry takes on specialization, which normally we think of as the means to greater efficiency, and it is, uh, but he dwells on the dark side of specialization from his point of view, um, that it elicits the idea and somewhat the illusion of total control that he says is totalitarian in its ambitions. He uses that term to mean that it aims at total control of the environment and by consequence um, total control of the social situation as well. There's some kinship here with Elul's point that at a certain point technique um, uses people as human capital and plugs them in to whatever uh, however things are being produced rather than allowing human beings to choose how they will live and what they will do. He argues that specialization excludes other possibilities through discouraging thinking about the whole system, but that this latter way of thinking is essential if we're going to think about what will actually produce greater human happiness and um, health. There's a quote on the bottom of page 76 that's pretty characteristic of Wendell Berry. He says, first of all, therefore, if one is going to make a model farm, and that is like the futuristic farm we were talking about, one must give it a boundary, if possible a roof, that will keep out what it does, whatever does not work, weeds, insects, 
Diseases do not work. Leave them out. The weather works only sometimes, or on the average, leave the weather out. The work can be done by machines. Leave the people out. But chemicals and drugs, no matter how dangerous, do work. They are part of the boundary, so they can be let in. It may be a bit startling, he says, at this point to realize that what has been left out of this enclosure is health. As soon as pests, parasites, diseases, climatic fluctuations, and extremes are left out, resistance to these things is also left out. And this resistance in the soil and the lives that come from the soil is what we call health. And so for total control, we have given up health, which is also a kind of control, safer by far than a plastic roof, but never total. So in his view, the ideal futuristic um, all-enclosed factory farm is kind of like the mother who won't let her little child, um, you know, eat with dirty fingers and has to sanitize everything constantly and creates this environment that is so germ-free that the child grows up extremely vulnerable to any infection because he doesn't have an immune system. Well, I shouldn't say that. He has a weaker immune system. And so Barry is basically saying that nature has its way of encouraging health, um, and it's through basically um, adapting to and fighting back against these insults from weeds, insects, and diseases. Um, and that, again, you know, given this, uh, the mindset that Wendell Berry has, um, he asks, what are we changing when we leave these things out? Well, we're changing the ability of our crops and animals to um, be healthy, be healthy by adjusting um, and fighting back against these things, which makes them less robust in the long run and and more vulnerable to an insult that somehow is not prevented by the system. Barry thinks we put too much trust in our own ability to control things and too little trust in nature's ability to regulate itself. And he doesn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. He doesn't want to throw out uh, or get rid of nature's ability to defend itself um, because he's more of a mind that that is what we need to rely on for our future. So we see a direct contrast here with Barry's way of thinking um, compared with Ronald and Fraley's way of thinking. For them, the only way to really tackle the problems created by the environment is through human innovation. And for Barry, the only way to deal with the uncertain needs of the future for food are to not to drastically alter nature's own ability to function and produce food. I'm not going to try to conclude this argument. I just want to really highlight that there is an argument um, between these two, two positions, um, even though both can arguably be seen as variants of a conservative perspective. Barry gets into a concern for how the total control that could take place through um, agricultural technology could create a power, power on the part of those who actually have the knowledge and technology um, to control agricultural production. And he doesn't mince words. He calls this an evil. He seems to be saying this is an evil that people should want to avoid when you put this kind of power into the hands, whether it's government or private corporation, I shouldn't say private, but either government or corporations, in Barry's view, you've given them the power to create and destroy life. Um, he makes a point similar to John Locke's point um, when he says that, when Locke says that a government that's powerful enough to take your property from you um, and deprive you of the means to um, basically feed yourself and take care of yourself is a government that can take your life. And therefore, so Locke concluded, we have a right to revolution. So Barry seems to be saying, whether of government or corporations, that if they have this kind of control over our food supply, 
they have the power to take our lives, and in that way they become dictatorial or even totalitarian. So he's projecting into the future the sort of dystopia um, in which there's too much control, and that control is used for um, political and social power and leaves people less free as a result. And he asks, how did such a possibility even become thinkable? And his answer is, it seems to me that it is implicit in the modern separation of life and work. What he means by this is that by basically plugging people into a system of specialization, they have taken them away from their source of independence, again, from the land, from their ability to uh, take care of their basic needs, and by being separated from that and not knowing exactly how it works and not having direct access to it, they become vulnerable uh, to those who do have that control. So I guess you'd have to say that this class has folks who are extremely hopeful in it and folks that are very pessimistic, that we go back and forth between these visions of a hopeful future and these visions of catastrophe. Uh, uh, but even implicit within the visions of catastrophe are solutions, as I've pointed this out before. There's no one who writes about this or talks about these things that doesn't have some hope. Um, and by covering all of this ground, hopefully we will, we will have more information and more perspectives that can be used to generate solutions that may be different from what any of these people are exactly thinking of. So next week we'll get into some more specific solutions with the ideas of homesteading and permaculture, and we'll be especially uh, focusing in on permaculture as a way of farming. Um, everybody who wants to know anything about uh, organic agriculture um, needs to understand what permaculture means, and so we can at least do a little bit of an introduction there. And it falls under the general category in this syllabus of anarchism, simply because um, in the next few weeks we'll be looking at peoples who, people who decide that they're going to more or less experiment independently with how they want to live, regardless of the overarching systems that they have to, happen to live under. All right, so I'll see you next time. Bye.